Happy to be back with you all. We'll just jump right into everything. So we do have what is probably the biggest announcement in the company's history that we're bringing to Tech Live today. So we're super excited to be here. I wish um, we had gone first thing this morning because I've been nervous all morning, excited to get this done. So <laughs> let's do it. But before we do that, I'll tell you when we get to the news, the embargoed bid is only embargoed for a couple hours. We just want to get through this session with you all before um, releasing the news. So. That's why we timed it the way we did. But I do want to give you a little bit of detail about where our company momentum is um, before we jump into the news. So just a little bit of a reminder about the company history. We were founded back in 2018. And we, ha we were founded really, well, I'm not going to talk for David. David, why were we founded? <laughs> <laughs> we have you here. <laughs> uh, really to change how people use data. Uh, moving from a world of store putting data to rest in storage and having the storage serve it back out uh, to a world where data lives always in motion, orchestrated, independent of the infrastructure, to truly make data that's a platform layer thing independent of infrastructure and storage. So big vision of having data in motion versus having data at rest. And so we, had, we became generally available with our global data environment technology back in 2021. So it's been just over two years now that we've been in general availability. And during that time, the goal has been, as David said, to unify data into what effectively is a parallel global file system and have the ability to put that in motion to the humans, the applications, the compute clusters that need to use it. And so as we've been moving along, we've really noticed that there's some specific areas with the technology that our customers are adopting us for. One side of it is the data management, data motion piece, and the other side of it is the performance attributes of our environment. And so what we're really going to be focusing on today is how customers are adopting us on the performance side of the environment. And as we think about what the value is of Hammerspace, Ingesting, keeping GPUs, big compute clusters busy is super valuable as data is being created and processed. And then being able to place it and make it local to the humans or applications that are using it is the other part of the technology that we bring together into a single global data environment. Um, going into this year, um, I'll go through the metrics of what we announced a couple weeks ago as far as corporate momentum. Um, but we're already experiencing over 1,000% year-over-year growth in just the first two months of the year. So while we announced that last year we had 300% growth in our sales pipeline and we were talking about our customer growth, this year we've already done 1,000% growth in just two months. Um, we're growing incredibly fast. And I think, actually, it's Ben, who um, we've been doing some analyst work with, put it, Every enterprise needs Hammerspace. They just may not know it yet. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. I love that quote. And we definitely find that as we talk to customers, that as they're looking at the business problems they're looking to solve, the technology solutions they have in place in their IT environments today and where they're coming up short, that Hammerspace is a great forward-looking solution to their business problems. So that's what we'll be really focusing on. Um, I do have a slide here. We've won a lot of awards over the past year or two. Um, it's kind of fun to be able to go to all these conferences and we usually win best of show and that sounds kind of cocky and I don't mean it that way. It's just, it's so innovative and new in solving such key pain points that we find that the judges at these shows typically award us as one of those new innovations that is so needed in the industry that we end up being quite um, recognized in the awards as well. Um, new news is um, we will be putting this press release out Monday, but if you want to write about or include it in any write-ups that you do today, feel free to. A gentleman named Brian Polowski has joined Hammerspace um, to run our what? performance. <laughs> I was waiting for you to look. <laughs> I was like, come on, Chris, pay attention. <laughs> um, he has joined Hammerspace as of today to run our performance engineering team. Um, do you want to talk <laughs> a little so, bit about that? <laughs> Um, yes, uh, it's really exciting to have uh, Brian join us. As you know, we have a very distinguished CTO, Tron Mikkelbust, is the kernel maintainer of the NFS client stack, and there is you know, nobody like that. Well, let me put it like this. 
Brian was Tron's mentor back in the early days in NetApp when he first got into doing NFS work. So we're very excited to have Brian join us um, and uh, help run the one of the areas of most importance for the company around performance engineering. So, um, so today is actually his day one. I was speaking with him on the phone this morning, UK time, so that meant it was about one in the morning, his time. He was so excited and like, put this in the press release, put this in the press release about why he's so excited to be here. Um, but kind question? of in summary, yeah, Do please. You're a UK company? Uh, no, we're, we're headquartered in the US. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. how many people do you employ? Um, we're uh, over 100 people now. Is it any revenue in Central Europe or uh, continental Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 30%. About 30%, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. We work with a lot of global companies, mm -hmm. and um, some of them are based in the US, some are based in Europe. <laughs> And most of them have data centers in multiple locations, but about 30% of the headquarters are based in Europe. So, yeah, some of those are like uh, NHS is a customer mm -hmm. through a partner. Um, who are some of the other accounts? Some of the movie studios? <coughs> three Lateral is yeah. not, is three, three Lateral, who is based out of Central Europe. Um, Anything Serbia. in Germany? So, uh, yes, Deutsche Telekom's uh -huh. T-Systems okay. Group uses us for their Kubernetes uh, environment as the data platform. So, yep, yeah. um, one of uh, three of the world's largest telcos that are using Hammerspace already. It did. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yep. And so as Brian, I was out talking to him about the press release, which we're writing up, um, you know, ask him, why did you join Hammerspace? Why now? And his comment really was, you know, that there is such critical mass of the world-class technologists that are working at Hammerspace. Yeah. Our vision is quite aspirational, and he believes that we have the technology and team to deliver on it. So he wants to be a part of that, essentially. Um, and we're finding that the talent that has formed this kind of critical mass at Hammerspace is absolutely astounding in the industry. And as you look through this presentation, we talk about what we're doing. Um, it's all in production today. It's not an aspiration of something we might do in the future. We're taking the approach as we market of waiting until it's proven at scale in production and then introducing it into the market. Um, so we're making sure we're able to prove what might seem like magic or seem impossible um, is actually in production today. And that's really the the foundation of what makes Hammerspace exciting and why people are joining us. Yeah, and what we're gonna go into now is part of that. We are innovating in the world of NFS protocol client. The NAS world has really stagnated. There's not been a lot of innovation, and yet the drive and demand has been increasing. Major step function in demand thanks to AI workloads driving HPC into the mainstream. So a big part of Brian join, joining the company is because what we are doing is truly innovating at the most fundamental level within the world of NAS, namely with the NFS protocol, the client technologies and such that are built into Linux. I thought your work developing the software was more or less done. Brian's a fundamental guy. I mean, he writes operating systems. It, that's fair, and the technology is, but there's still a lot of things to go, and especially around performance. We are now at the boundary of pushing, pushing the industry to new levels of performance, not just for NAS, but as you're going to see, for supercomputer class file systems. And we believe the need is only going to continue to grow, to work at exabyte scale, of data and feed it uh, at full performance into got, AI you systems. You've got vicinity. Pardon? you got vicinity involved. Vicinity. Vicinity. Uh, yeah, that's RDMA over, over large distances. That solves a specific kind of problem, but that's, that's uh, only at one, let me put it like this, the same problem repeats at different scale factors. One thing is between servers in the data center, between storage systems within the data center, across whole data centers. So that's across whole data centers, right? Um, there are other scale factors where you need to be talking about, you know, microsecond level latencies, serving data across servers, yes. So, but yeah, vicinity is a great partnership. 
So what will what this is the embargoed piece just for a couple more hours. So this is the beginning of the announcement slides. Um, so as we've been working on with our customers at a global level on how their architecture, their forward-looking data architectures, there's some clear gaps that are emerging in the way data is being used. And what we're identifying is, as you look through kind of what's happening in the world today, certainly there's the rise of AI and people are trying to train into models. Those models want to write to standard NFS. That's what they're designed to do. If you think about the performance characteristics of a big compute farm, it looks a lot like an HPC cluster, a supercomputer. And it, there's this issue that has occurred within the enterprise as they're wanting to use AI and big compute farms, you know, largely big GPU compute farms, but whichever processor it is, the challenge is the same, that the NFS systems that they have available to them today aren't fast enough to drive those compute farms, and the supercomputing class file systems, which are fast enough, don't meet their enterprise standards, so they're stuck. There's a real problem that has occurred in these workloads where the IT teams need some kind of solution to drive those performance um, clusters and do it in a way other, in, in some kind of efficient way. Just adding more and more over-provisioned storage systems to try to drive performance often won't get them to the scale they need or is extremely expensive if it can get them to the scale they need. And then there's the issue of data silos, that data has been created in different systems over the years. Some for speed, some for cost, some are old, some are new. And they want to use and have visibility into all of the data which they have and be able to load that into AI models, data analytics, use it for business use, and it's, they don't have a good solution for unifying those silos. So data silos and the need for NFS are huge challenges. And then the final part is just the speed, that existing NAS, existing SMB NFS stores, and object stores just don't have the performance attributes. And this isn't just about max system throughput, it's the variety of I.O. patterns, the metadata ops, it's the read, the write, the checkpointing, the throughput, that the workloads that they were designed for, which was really streaming workloads, are not matching how the data is being used now. So now they have data silos that are designed for a different kind of throughput and maybe don't even use the interfaces that the applications need. And so this is create this big issue and this is the gap that this announcement is going to I solve. like to think of it as AI is forcing a reckoning on the industry to deal with the fact that we've never really fixed uh, having the performance levels that you need in something that's plug and play and standard it is just NAS. Using exotic file systems doesn't cut it. NAS doesn't get the performance level you need. And that's aside from the challenges of data being a localized thing in specific storage and not available across to other data centers where you might need to get access to GPUs. So we've, we have now uh, a reckoning of needing to solve how to physically distribute and manage distributed data and how to serve it at high performance using standards that make it very easy to use. And so AI is, and we'll go into more detail here of, of the different stages and how that the AI workflow actually is, is causing that. Yes? What about the heat and the source utilization of um, this sort of high performance computing? The heat, uh, the, what was that now? The, the amount of heat and the resource utilization. Um, <laughs> you know, the, is it sustainable? Um, well, you know, Zuckerberg talked about putting in a million GPUs. Yeah. And that takes about half the output of an entire nuclear power plant. So, yeah, it's a lot of heat. Not just in, in uh, burning it on the GPUs, but actually generating the power in the first place. the um, popular these days, yes. the global warming as well. Yes. Uh, I mean, there are new AI architectures under development for special purposes, mm -hmm. uh, chips. Yes. which use a lot less energy, but also maybe they use different interfaces and stuff with Indeed. compatible to this kind of hardware. So uh, this is about the data feeds in and out to those yes. and how to aggregate and pull the data in. So the more efficient you make the compute, the more demanding it's going to be on getting 
larger quantities of data at ever higher performance rates. Mm. So we love to see those innovations. And one thing is the, the axiom that's always true. Mm. It needs to be POSIX. It needs to be a standard file system. It can't be object storage, S3, whatever. There is a, a, a resurgence of the need to uh, have it be a real networked file system not uh, not some custom-built object store thing. Those don't get the performance levels you need, and it's not the standard interfaces. I heard an interesting quote. I'll have to share with the crowd here because it was a fun quote. It was just with a, a customer, a large uh, web scale, um, and he said, those who don't know POSIX, and that's the file system interface at the heart of the OS, those who don't know POSIX are destined to recreate it poorly. <laughs> because at the end of the day, you're going to have to build all the stuff that's in there, and you're going to do a shitty job of it, and you're going to find, oh, I should have just done POSIX. Okay. NFS how, how and businesses spent the last 10 years rewriting their applications to support object. Gen and it was, it was because to get to scale, the cloud guys pushed a web architecture on them that was viable when you had very large homogenous apps, their website. So the web guys stepped outside of POSIX using HTTP REST object storage because you have one app, your website thing. When you're talking about AI with lots of different chips and all, it has to be something that the OS actually knows. And let me point out that the main indictment, the way you can prove the failing of it is in an object store, you can't even have it host your programs and your binaries and shared libraries. The OS doesn't even know how to load software from it. Okay? You need a POSIX interface even just to house the software. Something as simple as that. Anyway, is yes? It, uh, is your product focused on real-time stuff or is it focused on like not so, so time sensitive. So uh, mixed workloads, it includes inference, which is definitely real time. Inference is a more real time thing, whereas training is a more batch thing. Do, how do you compare it with Zeno? To pardon? Zeno. Zeno is a real time protocol for integrating data, yeah. which is based on S3. Yeah. And which is adopted by, by the way, by the car industry, by robotics in big extent. So a lot of that stuff would be like a message passing alternative yes, sort of thing. Exactly. This isn't talking about this. This is talking about Latency. the underlying file system. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is, this is Bigger file data. system. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So as we've been getting adopted in AI workloads, but you could say that this is also very analogous to HPC workloads, essentially what Hammerspace <laughs> does is we aggregate data from multiple data sources. Um, we aggregate it into a single file system. It's a parallel global file system. So as that data is being ingested from multiple data sources um, into a single file system, the benefit you get there is applications, users, data scientists, data engineers, the different types of AI models are all connecting here to the global parallel file system. And whichever data source they want access, whether it's remote or local at the edge in different systems, they don't have to worry about that. That's all connected into a single global file system. So that really helps simplify the idea of ETL. You know, you don't necessarily have to ask IT. You don't have to extract. You have visibility into it based on whatever permissions you have. You have access to all those data sources. And then as you... Let, let, let me use a concrete example. <laughs> there was just uh, with uh, a drug company. They have machines that um, you know, gather massive amounts of, of imagery data uh, as part of the process. Um, or somebody like a Blue Origin who is gathering video and other telemetry off of test fires of rocket engines. Those things have to be put somewhere. Uh, they get ingested, they can be posted over S3, or they can be dropped in over SMB or, or NFS, but they end up going into a global file system from which it can be orchestrated around the world and consumed within different data centers. So that's where objective-based data placement means that without copying the data, you're simply asking for it to be uh, served locally from distributed points, from different data centers around the world, where it can then be consumed uh, with high performance uh, 
access at all of those points. So we've spent over the last year or two since we launched the global data environment talking a lot about how we unify storage silos or unify data sources, how we place that data where it's needed in an automated way all within a single file system. But we've also identified a gap in, in the market, and this is a piece of how customers are using us that really has led to the announcement that we have today that the performance attributes of these data sources and as they're going into the compute process is really lacking, that they need this parallel global file system to do the checkpointing, the tuning, the training, the adapting, and whichever storage system they're sitting on today is lacking the performance attributes that they need. And that's where we're introducing the technology of um, hyperscale NAS, which I'm going to hand it over to David a little bit to talk about that. So let's look at the landscape. You have traditional NAS and scale-out NAS, which are designed to suit enterprises that are very risk-averse. First and foremost, the number one requirement is that uh, it's safe. It protects the data, it governs the data, they can't run afoul of data uh, regulations, uh, compliance, and it has to be easy because these guys can't hire on staff. They're not tech companies to start with, so the IT staff has to be able to use things that are plug and play and easy. And so you will see that places that use NAS are because they value these two things. It's got to be safe and easy. What they sacrifice in the name of getting this is having it be super high performance. It's, it's not a Lustre or GPFS or a parallel file system in the supercomputing world. And it doesn't have the cost effectiveness, especially at very large scale. They pay a premium to get something that is easy to use and play. Now, if you look at the supercomputing world, it is the diametric opposite. Anybody doing HPC, they want speed at any cost, um, including sacrificing having it be stable and whatever. They don't actually trust it to store the data long term. It's almost more of a staging area and a way to feed the, the clusters. And you have to copy out of NAS into it. Almost anybody in this group also has NAS systems as the home directories and the permanent store. This is just used as the space for doing the feeding and the checkpointing and the other interaction with the, uh, with the, with the supercomputer, with the, you know, the, the cluster of GPUs as it were. And they also have to have it be cheap. It needs to be software defined. It needs to use as little hardware as possible to be able to deliver the most performance for that hardware. So the two things that they value, ironically, are the exact opposite of these. And that's why we end up with this very bifurcated world where these two things, ne'er the twain shall meet. And you can see the likes of GPFS, Luster, uh, if you want a newer, less mature version of that, you've got like a Weka. These guys are, are you know, custom, hyper-tuned file systems around specific workloads. And then you have the enterprise NAS world that doesn't have the performance and scalability. It's not, uh, doesn't address the other needs. What we're here to say is that the, the hyperscale NAS architecture and it's not about hammer space, it's about the type of NAS that it is. It's the fundamental architecture, allows you to get all of these things in one. Um, then you don't have to copy things around. We're gonna start getting a little more specific. Back in the early days, you had scale up NAS. This is where Brian Pulowski cut his teeth at NetApp as the CTO, building the very first uh, file servers network appliances, an appliance on the network that had the file system built in, that was NetApp back to the 1990s. Then we introduced a scale-out architecture where you had front-end controller nodes and back-end storage nodes and allowed you to start scaling. You could get some aggregated performance, but because you ended up with a lot of contention here, after a certain number of nodes, it didn't really scale performance much more. Uh, but you were able to scale capacity, and that was the most important thing. And you can think about this these, both of these are really about scaling capacity. Um, obviously, from a performance perspective, having two layers and an internal network is rather inefficient from a, a performance scalability perspective. Well, what we are introducing here is a whole new architecture that allows you not just to scale out capacity, but also to scale performance linearly. 
and into the thousands of nodes. And it is a fundamental change to the most uh, foundational protocols, the NFS protocol, to make, it, to make this happen. We'll go into more specifics. Before you jump off of that, oh, yes. just, um, a couple of things that have occurred in the market that, you know, it's in, it's in the slide, but these were really designed for human generated data and home directories, humans that were using and accessing the data. What has changed in the world is a new architecture is needed for the machine generated data, whether that's autonomous vehicles, compute farms, whatever it is, machines need something different and faster that has the ability not just to store data, but to serve it to those machines. And so, you know, the kind of the, all of us have been in this industry a long time, and yeah, 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 and structured data has grown for a long time, and that's really what these were designed for, is to store so structured like data. So it's like human in the loop on the left. That's where the humans in the loop mm -hmm. maybe even generated. On the right, you've got machine-generated data going into machine-analyzed data in the training. The human's not in the loop anymore. It needs to be able to scale. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask us, not a stupid question, but how does this interface with the the world of production databases, transaction processing databases. Would you run those mm -hmm. databases on top of this yes. file system? Yeah, databases add structure to unstructured files. They ultimately are storing their tables and stuff in files. In Hammerspace, uh, you will see this, this hyperscale NAS architecture allows for very high IOPS, and it allows for IOPS scalability too, not just bandwidth. So yes, transactional database systems on top of this are indeed transformed in a similar way. Okay, so with transaction, you have the possibility, if you've got that sort of I.O. performance, of accessing the transaction processing data directly rather than copying it out to a data warehouse. So and keeping everything into one place. Yes. So I'd like. Yeah. Um, in brief, yes, we'll show more about the architecture to see that, but the ability to have the data routed directly from the database engines to individual storage nodes in parallel yeah. allows you to aggregate the IOPS. With data orchestration, you can pick up and move those files and redistribute them to where they're in closer proximity and able to get the higher performance levels. So this would be a, a revolution not just for your traditional customers, but for computing no, in general. That's yes. exactly right, yes. So then it's not going to be just one, it's not going to be just hammer space, it's going to be lots of people using this architecture. Exactly. Yes. Meeting. We're bringing the supercomputer architecture into the world of enterprise standard file systems, and it will change how enterprise applications are, are able to consume high performance. And you'll see as we go through, um, we've done a lot of work driving this into standards, and it, we do very much expect that this is the revolution in how computing is done. And we're the first, and we're champion, and we've invested a lot in working in the Linux community and things like that, which we'll talk about. Um, but yes, absolutely, there will be, there really isn't another way to accomplish what these compute intensive workloads need. This architectural shift had to happen. Yeah. As part of the reason I started the company, just like with Fusion IO, the shift to solid state had to happen. Somebody has to do it to move from these older architectures, fundamental architecture, driven by the fact that the protocol requires this, to stepping outside of the requirements of that protocol and introducing a newer protocol, just as standard, just as easy to use and plug and play, but doesn't have, doesn't drive this. The same way NVMe stepped outside of the storage protocols like SATA and SAS and let you get the flash closer to the server, this is the same kind of architectural shift that unlocks a level of performance that wasn't available before. Yes. Will you open source that? It is. That's actually one of the, yeah, that's actually, the, the protocol itself is. It's standard, it's built into NFS, and I'll tell you one of the reasons we're able to do this now and we're not able to before, because Linux won the OS war. And when it comes to performance at scale, Linux is the only OS that matters. We support the older protocols so you can consume and use data from, from anything. The older SMB, the older NFS, yes, as NAS you have to support those. But when it comes to performance at scale, we don't have to worry about Solaris and AIX and HPUX and the BSDs and the this and the that. That changed and that allowed us to put much more intelligence into the protocol and into the client. 
And that's why our CTO, as the kernel maintainer of that part of Linux, has been able to drive this innovation into Linux. So it's the fact that Linux won, and now we can put more brains in it to do the sophistication necessary and have that then be available to everybody. So good question. Mm -hmm. So it's not just AI, it's also IoT, presumably. It's Absolutely. IoT, and it's not just unstructured data, it's structured data applications too. Because yeah. this is the foundational layer of all computing, it ultimately boils down to bits in files. Yeah. Actually, I don't believe in unstructured data. All data is structured, if it's not structured, you can't use it. Even a letter there. is structured. Well, now with AI, you can make sense out of anything. Yeah. Not even, yeah, yeah it doesn't, doesn't. Well, AI just, can pull the structure out of anything, just like, that GPT yeah. is just currently you know, spitting out rubbish, so in fact, it doesn't always make sense. Of and one so, other thing I would mention there, um, you know, mm -hmm. hyperscale NAS, and we're going to talk a lot about what is the architecture and how does it work and whatnot, but um, when it, the reason we use the term hyperscale NAS is if you think about what happened with S3, Amazon, AWS came out with S3 to have efficiency of storing data at a level that was previously not possible. And there was a lot of fast follows. So thinking about the fast follows in other industries, Hyperscale NAS is kind of an analog in that hyperscalers are trying to figure out how do you drive as much performance as, efficient, as efficiently as possible, and that's where this has been proven. But it is relevant to anybody who has the need to have efficient performance in their environment. So whether you have 100 processors or 100,000 processors, the efficiencies and the performance attributes of it benefit every single environment. And so it's an analog to think about as category creation of paradigm shifts. Um, this is following architectures that are in production today um, in hyperscale environments. So it's not just about scaling up to crazy levels of performance. It's the efficiency of the scaling, which also lets you scale down to something at a, at a better cost point. So it's a dynamic range in the scalability that's important. Yes? Is there any, any attempt or any competition to do something like that from others? So uh, there, nobody yet has uh, adopted uh, this and the, uh, the, the parallel NFS and the flex files layout. There have been academic attempts and <clears throat> like Los Alamos National Labs, Gary Greider, who you're gonna see is quoted in our press release, proposed this 20 years ago and funded, econ funded uh, um, the academic work uh, to lay a groundwork, but it never, went anywhere commercially. And part of the reason for that is he focused mostly on the performance aspect. And what you'll see is that Hammerspace focused on using that same architecture to decouple data's physical location from its logical view, separating metadata from data. That's the same key innovation that allows you to get the performance, but we used it mainly to allow you to orchestrate data and solve the issue of data locality and siloing. And, and so it's the twin of using it to solve data siloing and the data management problem, but it incidentally solves the performance issue. And he was focusing mainly on how to use it as a performance file system, so he didn't have to have Gary in the press release. He's the guy who actually funded the creation of Lustre and GPFS, the US DOE. He was the guy uh, who did that. Um, and he has, from the beginning, wanted to see Enterprise NAS adopt those architectures so that he didn't have to go and use those exotic file systems and could use off-the-shelf stuff. They want to be able to use off-the-shelf stuff. But frankly, HPC was too much of a niche back then, and focusing solely on the performance aspects of that architecture weren't enough. Now. There's huge demand for performance, thanks to AI, and the architecture also solves data management by allowing you to orchestrate data. And so that's- I think another way to also think about it is, um, we are the first for sure, and we're quite a ways ahead of anyone else who will do it. Um, and the industry, because it's so important, is rallying around Hammerspace. So whether it's the national labs or the web scalers contributing code and helping in the development and what we need to do, um, or industry partners, which we're going to talk about as we go through later too, jumping on board and participating. So Eric Herzog from Infinidad is in our press release too, and he sees 
the importance of this in expanding the infinity of that footprint in enterprises. So there's a lot of industry support and for this first move in this in this new direction. Yeah, just like um, Isilon introduced the scale out NASA architecture and for a long time they were the only ones who had done that and then others followed. Well, the same team once they less than create Cumulo or whatever. Um, and you still see echoes of that like with Vast using the same architecture again. Um, but uh, I expect we'll see followers here as well. It's, a, it's, um, it's more complicated of a problem. It'll take them longer. And there is some natural uh, incumbency advantage uh, to, to being out there first. Um, even though the plumbing and the clients and all that is, is open source and, and uh, standard. So the fundamental architecture is that for the first time we separate this and you have two lines instead of one. You have the control plane and this is what you go to when you want to talk to a given file. You, you open the file by going here, but what he hands you is the routing information and then when you do the I.O., you go directly to the storage. That ability to separate the control plane from the data path is the foundational change in architecture. It's what supercomputer file systems have used for a long time, but has never really been used, never been used in the enterprise NAS space. Um, so uh, we... So this sounds, I mean, this sounds like um, what um, Datacorp did like 20 years ago, block the storage virtualization, when it's separated. Yeah, what you'll, yeah. You kind of so, well, there's a difference between muxing and routing. Like, think of it like DNS. This is your DNS server, but then you follow the, the once, you res, once you do your, this lets you resolve the route and then you route the data directly. With, with things like IBM's SVC or, uh, or um, uh, EMC's uh, VPlex or, or the data core stuff, you fundamentally end up with another box in the middle that's, that's muxing the data. And that's why it kills your performance and it doesn't work. This is different because um, uh, the data is routed and goes direct. There's no additional hop in the network. And this and is a very parallel. proven architecture. This is how supercomputing file systems work. Luster, GPFS, they take metadata out of band. There's an intelligent client on the servers that are talking to it that knows how to speak to the metadata server, but the data path is direct. And so it's not a novel thing. What's novel is that you can do it in enterprise with enterprise standards. Yeah. So you can see this guy, he's having to deal with two of these paths. He has to know how to do the whole tap mm -hmm. dance of talking to him just to get the routing to go here, right? Yeah. But that allows these, the, the control plane with rich complexity to now scale separately from the data path, which can trivially scale additional performance. So if you think back to that chart that, you know, you won't remember it, but you'll get a copy of the slides where supercomputers needed performance and cost, and this is how they did it. Now enterprise needs that, but they also need reliability and enterprise standards. So we're taking their architecture and putting it into yes. an enterprise environment. So you research the metadata, which data you need, and if you have some information about what you need, you go to down the data path. So it, it's a little simpler than that. File systems have a specific structure of their metadata. It's okay. the directory structure itself. Yes. Directories and files and attributes and access controls, uh, whether it's a Windows file systems or a Unix file system, there's a superset of that file system. So when we talk about this metadata, we're talking about the file system metadata the names of the directories, the names of the files, their, their access controls. Now, it goes beyond that. You can have enhanced metadata, tags and labels and stuff like that. But uh, fundamentally, that's what we're talking about with metadata is, is the, what is it called? It's, when you think of a file, you're actually thinking of its name, right? But it represents a string of bits. And this separates the string of bits that makes the contents of the file from the logical identity of the file. I want to do research on the data. Do I look at the metadata? So you can, and by enriching the metadata, you can make it so now these are just metadata ops and I don't have to go to the data as often. But if you do go to the data, now I can go to the data in massive parallel because I can have many of these storage okay. nodes and many direct paths. I can do the research on metadata and storage same time. Yes, that's right. Okay. And the storage you are now, it's trivially parallel. You can have many of them accessed in parallel automatically. So, um, 
This also allows us to change the data lo or to solve the data locality problem because now we can move data while it's being accessed. We can um, decouple the data's physical presence from its logical view. This is about the logical view of the data and that's about the physical presence. And the ability to separate those two is fundamental. Um, now, the other enhancements that we put into the NFS 4.2 spec, the NFS 4.2 spec came from my team several years ago and the flex files, the parallel NFS flex files layout inside of that is what allows you to do this. That has now been built into Linux all the way back to RHEL 7. We're on RHEL 9 now. So this goes back five plus years ago. Nobody's using stuff older than RHEL 7 in the data center, generally speaking. In other words, Linux, as it's the bulk deployed today innately has this capability already in it. You don't even have to rev to a newer version of Linux. Okay, any questions? So far. There's a question. Yeah, they did. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, well, do we have to have a critical mass of adoption by other companies besides Telespec before this really takes off? Um, not from a server side. Right. And the client is built into Linux. So I would say we've overcome that because the distribution of the freeways that we need to use happens automatically just with every Linux install. Every Linux install on every standard Ethernet network on its very standard environments. So like David said, the plumbing is already there. So probably not, no. But anybody else have that actually do some work to adopt this, don't they? No. It, 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 no, it's as easy to install and use as regular enterprise NAS. Not, okay. They don't even know the difference. Our customers don't even know that this is under the covers happening. And that's the big deal, though. I, I mean, your, your question is astute in that HPC file systems never got enterprise adoption because a lot of the paths you're going down in your head right now, it's specialized how do you skills, get, how specialized do you get the network, critical specialized mass? blah, blah. This is as simple as use the storage you already have the servers you already have, the network you already have, and install a bit of software and it presents itself to the applications in the way they're used to, it, it doesn't require any changes in the customer environment. That's why it will get adopted. But I guess I was thinking a bit about the not invented here syndrome, but um, with other players. What we are seeing is that right now, uh, anybody who has any understanding of the internals of this stuff has been <laughs> desperately waiting for innovation to happen here. So, um, and you know, people thought, people thought for a while NFS was dead, but AI and containers and the increasing demand for performance, the increasing demand for real POSIX interface instead of S3, that has created this, this pressure point where we have to solve this and actually innovate again at the fundamental level of the protocol that our, hadn't been happening. Our customers, we've had two in like the last week, one who said it at our company kickoff who said make NFS great again and another one who David saw this week out in um, the, up in Amsterdam, Amsterdam that was wearing a hat that said make NFS great. Like there's this and those aren't coming from us. I mean, we have some shirts being made along those lines too, but there's such a huge demand here that there's just pent up need that do you, people do are you clamoring. See this as an OEM product within standard storage vendors or something? So, um, <laughs> as an overlay, it's very compatible with existing storage systems, and we'll talk about that some. And yes, there is good discussion there. When you look at like our partner Infinidat, and we have partnered well with Pure Storage as well. Um, you'll see, especially those that aren't, you know, like so invested in their NAS architecture, folks who came from a block storage background that are now trying to go into a file storage world, they're much more open to doing a leapfrog and have it using Hammerspace as a leapfrog versus the incumbents. So this is what it looks like when you start scaling and the reason why it scales. Now you get full parallel access many clients accessing many storage nodes. That's why if you double the number of storage nodes, you double the number of the clients, you've got double the IOPS, double the bandwidth, no question asked, because there's zero contention. But was it grounded in pocket separation, the infrastructure? Does it uh, uh, impact the... The infrastructure. I mean, for example, in the manufacturing sector, 
Ah, is it more of latency of the AI uh, yeah. difference in the in the edge? This this has major implications for latency because it's a it's a direct mapping. If you use scale out NAS, you have to have controller nodes out front and an internal network. Now. Isilon used InfiniBand for the internal network very early, before InfiniBand was really used for much of anything. And now um, Vast is touting how they're using NVMe over fabrics across their internal network. The fact that they even talk about NVMe over fabrics is because they have to have an internal network. This gets rid of the whole need. So uh, yes, reducing latency is uh, one of the important features, which increases IOPS as well allows you to get more bandwidth. So um, now we take this a step further so you can see the full blown nature of our architecture. You have your compute nodes where you're doing data processing. So this is machine, machine to machine scaling. And then you have human in the loop kind of stuff where you're going out maybe to Windows and Mac operating systems or, or other uh, desktops or whatnot. Those can go through our data service nodes where it gets translated to the older protocols. So just because we have and use the newer protocol doesn't mean we can't supply the older protocols. It's just the older protocols have the same constraints that they've always had that you have to go through a controller node in essence and we have those so you can get to the get in through the the thing. Um, so yeah you get the best of both worlds but where performance matters, you're going to be using Linux and you're going to get the parallel scale. Where compatibility, ease of use to your desktop matters, you're going to be able to use SMB and NFS v3 oh, just like you always did. Mm -hmm. How much does the, do the controller nodes influence the speed of the whole thing? Well, the controller nodes, uh, uh, they are having to retransmit the data. This is the same architecture for a scale out NAS, right, where you had an internal network and an external network. You could link, think of it like this. Because we've standardized on parallel NFS for our internal network, it allows clients to connect directly to the internal network and bypass having to go through a controller. That's another way to think of the same thing, is um, the, uh, the controller node that does the diffusion of data across the back, that capability is now built into the client. So the uh, so every Linux node on the planet can sort of be the controller node to distribute the data. It's a different way so to think of the same thing. Very easy. What's that? Migration is very easy. If you've got the older stuff, you can move to the new stuff. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And this is why we can call it true enterprise NAS, because we support the full spectrum of feature set that's required, all of the old protocols. If you go and look at like a, a Lustre or a GPFS or a, you know, a Weka, they don't support SMB. They don't support the feature set and, and capabilities that you need in the NAS world. So if, if you, in your worst night, I mean, I'm really impressed by this, but that's, you know, living in devil. Devil's advocate for a bit, yes. But um, in your worst nightmares, what could go wrong? Is there <laughs> anything that could go wrong? It must be surely some possibility of things going wrong. Well, if you think about the broader challenge, what we're talking about doing is stacking NAS on NAS. Anything that's NFS legacy is a storage node in an NFS parallel environment. From a practicality perspective, when we go into an organization, what that means is that we're taking their Isilon, we're taking their NetApp, we're taking their Cumulo, even their VAST or whatnot, and we're aggregating it together, becoming the uh, control, controller and also being able to manage it. It helps it helps manage all that complexity, but that puts the burden on us to be the one to monitor the health of those things and to be able to report, oh, you're running out of space here and do all of that task. So we're, we are aspiring to take on the role of doing the storage and the data management within an organization, automating it for the first time. How data gets diffused and spread, not just across different systems, but across whole data centers. Okay, so the, the, the possible problem is politics. If the organization <laughs> yes. is not prepared to well, you're changing that the, you're changing the way people negotiate how data gets mapped to storage. Yeah. You know, it used to be you'd have the app owner 
You'd have the CFO even get involved in saying, well, where can we afford to put it? What kind of performance do we need? What kind? And then they would decide, oh, let's put it on this storage. Right. Well, we're making that so that that decision can be fluid and Hammerspace can dis redistribute the data. These could be object buckets in the cloud. They could be your Isilon or your NetApp or whatever kind of legacy storage that you have. That, that makes it very reasonable for these people down there. It decouples the yeah, yeah. agreements with you because then yes. they are in the business and get at least little of whatever you do. For sure. That's, that's right. What make. And that's, for example, why Pure Storage likes us is and they Infinidat have, and, or Infinite Data or any of them, that there's a requirement that their software doesn't meet for distributed workflows, moving data to compute, you know, that, you know, that the idea of you're going to move your compute to your data isn't realistic for most organizations. And they'll pull Hammerspace in and say, yeah, we want to sell our pure storage hardware and we want to put flash plates in and we'll let Hammerspace manage them. And would, they love that. Would it make any sense if uh, Vidya would like <laughs> OEM you because then they would have Possibility so, to like all the storage, which is there. The, the technical yeah. folks within NVIDIA yeah. already know that the future is parallel NFS. Yeah. And we are the leader in, in it. We're the ones pushing the frontier there. So, I, um, I think if I, want, if I could add something, the supercomputer people and NVIDIA always know NFS is the direction. And the question is whether it, is viable. Commercially viable. Right. And what Hammerspace has done is make it viable right. because the time is right. There's the, you know, the environment and the technologies that are available. And by applying it not good. just to get performance, but to get data orchestration right. and multi-data exactly. center access. Right. If it were just for performance, yeah, AI might be enough of a demand to make it mainstream enough. It, it alone might have in the last few years. But to have it be able to solve data orchestration and multi-data center, act, how you manage data, that's really what makes it so that every enterprise, every company around the world needs this, even though they may not know it. And the reason is because the data center is no longer the center of data. Right. And which you means your data can't be localized. Geographically or business unit-wise, this becomes a, essentially a global approach, which also aligns with the, the executive needs, right? It's not just an IT or or a technical need, it enables the executives, whether it's a, to your point, David, the CFO, a chief legal officer, a chief whatever officer, right, to view the data in the way they need it, and at the same time, leave the data where it is, right? And, and that's a key component, especially with GDPR, uh, 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 you know, et cetera, et cetera. So another key announcement today uh, is that Hammerspace, and our hyperscale NAS is GPU direct certified. Able to feed GPUs using NVIDIA's um, direct data path where the data can be off of the network and put directly into the GPUs and not have to go through the host memory. GPU direct is an important technology that allows GPUs to be fed more efficiently from storage. And the irony is, because we're using NFS, that capability was already innate. We didn't actually have to do anything because it's built into the NFS client and server to be able to push memory buffers directly into, over our DMA, into the GPU. So, but what makes this revolutionary is that with Hammerspace, you can take your existing storage, even if it's not on an RDMA network, and you can put the GPU direct front end on it. Three different ways. Um, you can have your own storage that's RDMA capable. You can have our DSX nodes that are RDMA capable on the RDMA network. And you can put the existing storage uh, and use the data orchestration to move the data so that it can then be fed in there. In other words, I can come in with an Isilon, I can come in with a NetApp, I can come in with any existing storage, and I can put hyperscale NAS on front of it and feed these over RDMA networks with GPU Direct. Any storage can now be GPU Direct certified, able to feed GPUs.
If you deploy an RDMA network and you have some nodes like our DSX nodes or bring your own that are capable of that RDMA capability. Yes. Um, another probably stupid question. Who do you sell this to? Do you sell it to the people selling network appliances and so on? Or do you sell it directly to Directly to customers. And and not just not just, you know, Fortune Fortune one thousand companies, but to the web scale guys. Because the web scale guys, and we're gonna talk about one, have suddenly gotten religion about needing a POSIX interface and a real file system, even though they wrote their own blob stores and had their own object storage. And service providers. You can see service providers, super yeah. attracted to service providers. Any questions on the GPU Direct announcement? Here's a cool thing, though. The NVMe can be in the GPU servers. And because we're standards-based, those can be the storage servers. So you don't even need separate storage. You can use the same nodes as your storage nodes that are the compute nodes and do HCI, hyperconverged infrastructure model. So talk about efficiency of scaling performance. Now you can use HCI models with GPU Direct. Do such servers exist? What's that? I've never heard of hyperconverged GPU servers before. Yes. Almost everybody who deploys GPU servers has NVMe. And everybody's already running Linux, which means it can already do this. You don't have to deploy any of our software here to do this. You simply export this NVMe using the built-in NFS server, and it becomes a storage node, and we can orchestrate data and serve it around it. So the beauty of this is no custom hammerspace technology required on each of these nodes. It's all built into Linux. You just put us on the side, we aggregate it, and make it into a storage pool, a shared file system across so all of it. It's a new service for hyperscalers. Well, so yeah. The, storage on their GPU or not? Yeah, then, yeah. No. This, this is appropriate for some. Others like storage specific nodes with a lot more NVMe and going over a network. Um, but there are scenarios where the peer-to-peer -peer distribution makes sense and scenarios where storage dedicated nodes. And the beauty is you can mix and match. I can have this and the other because data orchestration allows me to move the data. So this could be combined with your own existing NAS or with, with commodity servers that have, are dedicated as storage servers. You don't have to choose just this or that. Because data movement is presumed, you can combine it uh, in whatever topology you want. So could you have an application that um, understands this, analyzes the workload, and changes the configuration between these various um, setups, depending on what the workload actually looks like. So it might change just before Christmas. Like well, when you think about it, magic occurs when you can co-locate the data on the same node that's working against it. The closer you can get the data, the better off you are. So uh, the workload affinitization to the data placement is key. Hammerspace is capable of placing and moving the data so that it can be co-located with the compute that's using it. So like a container orchestration environment. Forget GPUs, let's just figure this is a compute environment and I'm running containers. Maybe your database engine, right, doing transactions. This would allow me to take the database table file and promote it so it's sitting on the local server. So now it's as if, it's as if he was using local high-performance storage for that transactional workload. So one of the things that always gone with databases was that they physically stored tables. Um, I'd much rather have a, an efficient um, physical storage and a logical table structure on top of it, and the two being totally disconnected. I don't think they're not to be used to well, I will point out this notion of separating the control plane yeah. from the data path mm -hmm. was key to making software-defined networking possible. Yes. It's, it's a recurring theme that separating control plane from data path allows you to step outside of the, the constraints that you typically have with scaling. And it's been way overdue to move that into the NAS world. Well, I've seen that diagram drawn 
as a possible vast data architecture. What they don't tell you is that they have control nodes as well, and it's but having to bounce the data. The control nodes would be GPU based. You could say I have three types of nodes. I have the clients, I have the control nodes, and I have the back end storage. So it's not that they couldn't converge it, but you still have the multiple network hops. You would. Yeah, yeah. I can fold all three of those layers into one. Sure, um, but uh, it's uh, just as inefficient when it comes to the multiple traversals of the network. Yes. I mean, there is also this concept of bringing the compute to the storage. Would you say that this is unnecessary if you use that concept? So um, the old adage of moving the compute to the data, um, this allows you to move the data to the compute. Yeah, Whether you want to do the one or the other depends on specific circumstances. So you would say there's still room for this concept to integrate some more compute into storage devices? Yes. And for this way? Yeah. Whether you're pulling the storage up into the compute or pushing the compute down into the storage, it ends up being net net the same thing. Yeah. Especially if it's Linux running on it either way. Is it because it's an x86 server that we think of it as the storage coming up in? And because it's an ARM server, we think of it as the server going down into it? I mean, is this an embedded system versus a traditional system? What, what you're really talking about is putting the storage and the compute on the same node and being able to efficiently distribute and share the data across it. And to make that happen, you have to separate the control plane and the metadata from the data path. And that doesn't work in legacy protocols. Yeah. So you've got the graphics technology, graphics technology, the NVMe storage, and the backplane. What do you want to call the? Mm -hmm. the yeah, call it that. Ne bit. That network. That network. Okay. So these things obviously develop. They're kind of separate markets. They develop at their own speed. This stuff launches, and you kind of bring it together, and it works. What do you see as being? Which of those three kind of areas do you think will be the bottleneck? that will come up first. Do you think it will be that the storage, the storage NVMe stuff isn't quick enough, that the graphics need to develop a lot more, or the actual interconnect needs to get faster? Where do you see the constriction? So, um, taking a step back, the real constriction is the adoption cycle of folks grokking it and wanting to put it in their environment and, and knowing and deploying it. Just like with VMware, it took a while for people to think about what does it mean to deploy servers in the virtual? Here, we're decoupling data from the storage the same way VMware decoupled the compute from the computers running it. That takes a while to grok. That's the real limiting factor. The truth is, this architectural transformation unlocks so much latent performance. It does it so much more efficiently that what the next bottleneck is almost doesn't matter for a long time before we consume enough of this. Does that make sense? There's, there's so much slack in the system that by unknotting it, by getting rid of that knot, the extra layer, that extra controller layer, this extra rerouting function, by getting rid of that, it just makes so much more efficient. So it'd be one or two years of learning before they then go, ah, okay, this needs to be quicker, and then by that That's point, right. the stuff will and, the, and, and there typically are abilities to step to the next generation of this. Let's go ahead and four, 400 gigabit Ethernet instead of 200 gigabit Ethernet. So yeah, it becomes actually much easier to identify the bottlenecks when there's not the knot in the thing, when it's not all convoluted through the older architecture. So if you look at what this architectural approach actually implies, it means as you, owed, as you add more storage nodes and more clients, you get perfectly linear scalability into the thousands and thousands of nodes because there is no cross contention. In a scale-out NAS architecture where you have to have front-end controller nodes and back-end nodes, at a certain point, the performance no longer continues to scale. You probably You've heard this about the Isilon, after you add so many nodes, you've got additional capacity. It does you zero good for getting more performance. And if I use a newer scale-out NAS architecture like VAST that's using NVMO fabrics, okay, I might be able to get twice that before it kills over, maybe three times that. But it's still the fundamental to the architecture that at some point it, uh, it is no longer able to continue to add performance because of the crosstalk and contention of the internal network. And I just want to reiterate, this is, the reason we're launching now is because this is proven at scale in production into thousand plus node environments. It's not mathematical. This isn't hypothetical. Yeah. We're going to be able to talk about the specifics. Yeah. And that's what's happened over the last year that allows us to 
um, to talk about these. So Let me go in. Just going back to the mm -hmm. uh, to, to an, an example where you were running this on top of your existing kind of enterprise NAS. Mm -hmm. uh, but what does that mean for the future of that enterprise NAS platform? Do I still need it? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> it's like how what was VMware's relationship to the server vendors, right? When you know, in a sense, they were making it so much more efficient and and maybe even a little more interchangeable and more of a commodity. So there's definitely the fact that if Hammerspace becomes the file system, it devalues a lot of the, that. Um, so, uh, I think it's fair to say, you know, some of the scale on NASs are be used for SMBs that need home directories. You know, they don't necessarily need to power high performance computing clusters. You know, they don't have, there will be a space, but in enterprise that are using their data, um, there's not a lot of room because we're so much more efficient, but where they just need, you know, human generated home directories, sure. But this is why we're a little more friendly with, say, the folks who've come from a block storage heritage. They're not jealous about their file system right. credentials and, and yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, how does it go with IP converged systems? Like, do you have this concept of storage and server inclu included and yep. scaling out and scaling up mm -hmm. and having a network connection within the system and mostly software defined how it works? Mm -hmm. So. Will it in some way connect to these systems, or is you, it the uh, hyperconverged systems word? like a Nutanix or a or like Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nutanix doesn't really have the scalability that this offers. Um, you wouldn't be running a GPU workload like this no, on but them. Could you yeah. integrate? Yes. In you the, those. Almost every system out there that does storage can speak NFS and could be a storage node. So but we would it make sense because they integrate also the functionality of storage and, and compute in some way? In a very uh, closed architecture. So yes, but I would probably say since if it's a software defined thing, just use Linux off the shelf and you don't have to use a closed ecosystem kind of provider like that. The same is true for something like Hadoop, right? Hadoop just overlays on a bunch of servers and creates a shared storage pool. But it's not a POSIX file system, it's not high performance. And so we have customers who are using Hadoop who are saying, well, with Hammerspace, I can use the, reuse those same servers now with just off-the-shelf Linux and get a higher performing environment. Let me go into a little more detail to help. This, this sequence of slides has helped people understand the true implications of what we're saying. So if we look back, and I like to look back here because it's what I did at Fusion IO. So forbear with me for a minute. We had a day when people said SSDs needed to pretend to be SATA. You're, oops, we lost the A somewhere. Uh, SATA, and through a RAID controller. And the huge innovation that helped me build a multi-billion dollar company was to say, there is no reason why this has to pretend to be a disk drive just to go through a choke point when a single SSD can outperform an entire RAID controller. So what we need to do is get the RAID controller, oh, here you have data getting transmitted three times. It has to go through here, through here, and then through here. If we realize the RAID controller is the choke point, let's get rid of it. And thus was invented NVMe, going directly bypassing the RAID controller, even bypassing the protocol. It's not even trying to be SATA anymore, right? Um, and voila, we got rid of one of those network hops. Now, NVMe, by the way, is the highest volume uh, enterprise SSD of any form factor or, or connectivity. It's going to, in the next few years, be a half trillion dollars a year. It's already 300 billion a year. It's going to be over 500 billion a year in just the next few years. So NVMe eliminates that RAID controller. If we do GPU direct, we eliminate having to move through the root complex of the CPU. So GPU direct gets rid of the cost of going through memory. In other words, this becomes effectively one hop. Now, all of that's great for local, local storage, storage on the node with a local file system. If we want to make a shared file system, well, let's see how that's done. First, you have to realize that a shared file system, you end up with three layers. You have the mapping 
the internal flash translation layer that's mapping blocks onto the flash. And then you have something that maps the offset of a file to a block. And then you have the mapping of the directory name and the directory to, to its inode, just to go from the inode to the block. So you have three layers of mapping. The file name to the file, the file offset to the block, the block offset to the flash. If we want to make this a shared file system, the way people do that is this. This is your client over a network speaking NFS, and here's your controller node. You've heard me talk about scale out NAS and controller nodes. This is what the controller node does. It does the mapping of a file to its inode and the inode to a block, and then the blocks are written across the network to many different storage nodes. This is what the Isilon architecture looks like. This is what, what Cumulo, Pure, anybody who does scale out NAS, this is the controller node, that's the back end storage. This is the internal network, that's the external network. Now, this is where Isilon used InfiniBand to be fast. Um, but if you look at this, this is nine times that the data is getting retransmitted. Whoops, went one too many. Nine times that you're having to transmit the data chip to chip or over a wire through the network. This is why it's so difficult to scale performance in a scale-out NAS architecture. Now, um, what VAST realized is we could use a newer network that has RDMA and use NFS over RDMA and get rid of that. So now the data can go from the controller out the network more efficiently and over the network more efficiently. So the major innovation for VAST over an Isilon is to use um, NVMe over fabrics for the back end for how you distribute the blocks. That's it. That's, that's the VAST architecture and innovation in the world of scale out NAS is to get rid of that one hop. So now instead of nine, it's eight. This is what hyperscale NAS does, it gets rid of this whole function and puts it in the separate metadata server and pulls it out of the data path. Yes? To give me this question, it's not on point, but when you're doing all this stuff and this stuff's moving around, is somewhere in the deep you've got an incredible database that is being added to amended and updated at a phenomenal rate of knots when you've got unbelievable loads of users, loads of storage in loads of places. <clears throat> and it's ju just to try and keep a map of where stuff is. So that's the interesting part, like the map of where stuff is, because you just hit the point. Did you notice that this part came down here and this part went over here? Th this, is, this is really important and I'm getting way too detailed now, but I want you to understand. This is the directory structure and the file naming. This is the mapping of, of file offset to blocks. What is so innovative about a parallel file system? What was pioneered in the supercomputing world that we're cross-applying to the NAS world is a realization that you can split these two. And this goes down here on each and every storage node. So every storage node does the block mapping in parallel for itself, locally. This becomes nothing but the directory mapping. And this is low bandwidth. This is only done when you open the file or when you close the file or when you create it. This is what's done every time you write to it. So that is the, is the innovation, is to split these two functions of a file system and put one down on the storage node because this is now not talking block, it's talking blobs of data. It's talking <coughs> strings of data. It's talking, let's say, it's a full file system, but it's being used in a degenerate way just as a blob store. So here we're stacking NFS4 on top of NFS3, which allows the one to handle the directory mapping and the other to handle the block mapping. But pulling this whole thing out lets you basically cut in half the more than cut in half the total number of network hops. And that allows this to scale much more efficiently. So you're kind of delegating to a trusted partner. Well, you're letting <laughs> each of the storage node do what they always did. They already had that mapping function. We just don't use their directory mapping. These, instead of being directories down here, it's just a named blob.
right? It's just a, a number. So um, we're using a subset of the capability here, that here, and we don't even have to implement the block mapping up here. So there are two strict rules to make, hyper, to make hyperscale NAS work. The metadata server never touches data. It never touches the contents of the file. And it never gets involved on a per I.O. basis with anything. It's not necessary to acknowledge an I.O. as completed or committed or anything. That all happens here. So because he doesn't have to do anything on an I.O. basis and he never touches data, he's, he's just doing higher level operations like when you open the file or close the file. These very tiny metadata operations. And the IOPS, every last request, all of those are being handled here which can then scale out across many of those independently. Is that the Uber of day at storage? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. um, are there two cases? Um, if you are worried about latency, the number of network hops is really important. If you're worried about throughput, it doesn't matter so much because while a piece of data is going through, something else is going on at the same time. You can definitely make up for latency. You can definitely make up more bandwidth by having more concurrency. Yeah. But if I have to have two layers of networks, I've had to buy three times the port count. This has one network port, whereas this architecture um, here, I have to have one, two, three. Yeah. So you want to pay three times the networking cost? This is why they don't use this architecture in the supercomputing world. At scale, this won't work. It's too costly. Even if it's software defined, even if we were to give away our software, even if the software is free, the networking and all this cost, needing another server node, needing all the networking, chews it up. I guess I'm just thinking back to the, the days of the mainframe when the mother power of computing went on and the throughput on a mainframe was very much higher than you'd have thought of from the speed of the individual. And it's, and it's the concurrency that it can do yes, to drive yeah. it up. Yeah, you definitely have, par concurrency can allow you to, to, to make up for poor latency. Yeah. But the poor latency, um, the, actual, the additional network hops will kill your cost structure no matter what. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this we're gonna talk about is where we proved it at scale. We have a customer now who's running Hammerspace across a thousand storage nodes with a single Hammerspace metadata cluster serving 32,000 GPUs in parallel. This makes one of the, if not the fastest storage subsystems on the planet. Today. You don't tell us who this is? Can I tell you? No. No, you I cannot. No, I can't. <laughs> but um, what you'll find in David gets pulled into most of the conversations at this level, given that he's our CEO, but also he's the kind of chief architect of the product. Um, it is so similar to so many web scale environments, whether you're thinking of like the social media sites, you're thinking about e-commerce sites, any, they're all building architectures that look almost like identical to this. I was gonna say, you could tell, you could tell who it was by looking at who's got the capability of people don't have. Yeah. That's so, true, but if you think about what they're all driving towards, it's yeah, yeah. very, very similar. They go, wow, that's exactly what I'm building. And so yeah. there's a lot of commonality. So is this a, is this a new environment that the customer built bill out, or do you overlay it over an existing? So they already have one of the largest server infrastructures in the world to serve their web property. And part of this was they wanted to bring that to bear as opposed to using a research data center. They wanted to use their production data centers. And they already had uh, literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of servers within VME Flash. And so this allowed them to use those same, same servers that they already had deployed in mass as a software defined overlay. Um, I mean, part of it's not really relevant to this discussion, but part of me feels an awful lot of the processing done on these huge firms is um, unnecessary 
It's things like doing crypto coming through, which doesn't really bad for anybody. Um, it's things like using chat GPT to produce cat videos. Uh, and <laughs> well, this, this is, this, in this case, it's the, the training of the language, language language model. Yes. So and those, those take many yeah. months running continuously yeah. across yeah. tens of thousands of GPUs. And, and I wonder how much, I know they work, but I think there might be real issues with them because they're based on analyzing past data. So I don't see how yep. to predict the future. Well, that's why they need to be able to feed in new data and make sure the data is there and able to be fed. So yes. let's summarize here. This is the traditional scale out NAS architecture with an internal network and the external network. This is the InfiniBand or NVMe over fabric network side. It's standard protocol based and it has the enterprise feature set, um, but it requires the multiple networks, lacks the same performance and scalability. Um, the storage in the back tends to be vendor locked as part of it. And it's not capable of that hyper converged infrastructure of reusing the same nodes. Although what uh, Chris is telling me is that they're touting that they can do that because they don't mind combining all three of those layers into one. That, that's great. It'll suck uh, performance. But um, then uh, this is what uh, the hyperscale NAS architecture looks like. Uh, much more elegantly simple, but it depends very much on the intelligence in the client. And that's why Linux, having won the OS war and being able to drive the open source implementation and the standards body has allowed us to do this when it wasn't done before. So what about um, data services? Snapshots, mm. mutable snapshots. So that's the, the beauty is, is we have taken the time to implement snapshots, clones, worm, audit, antivirus, etc. And it wasn't just a matter of, okay, let's match, say, NetApp that's the gold standard with data on tap. We said we can do better than that because as a separate control plane, um, we can add sophistication there much easier. So for example, we added auto snapshotting at a file granularity whenever a file goes to change or be deleted. Snapshots in NetApp are a pain in the ass because you have to choose. Do I make them really frequently and clog up my system with snapshots or do I risk not having made a snapshot soon enough to catch something that a user damaged or lost, right? With Hammerspace, you can set an objective that basically says anytime it changes, Make a snapshot of that one file. Yeah. So, so we've taken the notion of the data services and the feature set and actually made a richer feature set uh, because as a separate control plane, it's easier to do that. Now, uh, only got a few more minutes, but I want to point out that one of the very cool things is that if you take a scale out NAS architecture, and this is a customer that was using Isilon, old disk drives, didn't even have flash, had a 300 node uh, render cluster. This isn't AI, this is more in the media world. They deployed Hammerspace on top of just that one scale out NAS. It's not like they added additional storage systems, it's just the one. But by having Hammerspace out front, they were able to double the size of the render farm where this was already saturated and failing by not being able to get enough performance. The reason for that is that even though there's two layers here, Hammerspace affinitizes and gives this the perfect scenario. Each controller node talks about a different subset of files. So it amplifies the performance of the scale out NAS that it's sitting on. Imagine if VMware actually made the server faster when you installed it, as opposed to slowing it down by adding the virtualization tax. What we're saying is that Hammerspace, when layered into an environment, can actually accelerate the performance, not only because it's offloading the metadata, but because it's making the data path more sorted and clean. It gets rid of the contention on the back. It gets rid of the cache overlap. So it literally allowed that Isilon, the exact same Isilon, to double the amount of output. Yes? We had a system and the backup on that system could take up to between an hour and 24 hours. Would having this kind of system change how long it takes you to back up your data? So, uh, yes, be able to do it massive parallel. But better yet, you could use data orchestration so that 
the snapshots are put off onto tape, which we just announced a few weeks ago, or put off in the S3 as your backup. You don't have to copy the data out of the file system. You don't have to scan it and get rid of that whole workflow. In a data orchestrated world, backup as you know it disappears. There's no reason to copy stuff out and back in. You can have it move it from within somewhere that's safe enough to rebuild it, even if you were to lose the whole world. So backups will ultimately go away. So if we summarize here um, in our last few minutes, the direct data path, the mixed, the high performance, different workloads, scalability that's linear, uh, you can accelerate third-party NAS systems like, like we were just talking about. It's standards-based. Uh, lets you use hyper-converged topologies because it's all standard. It's just Linux on both sides. Um, agnostic as to what kind of storage you use. Any traditional NAS is a storage node. And you get to choose your network. Um, it can be an RDMA-capable network. It can be InfiniBand. It can be Ethernet. Um, what we found is that with the NConnect option that Trond, our CTO, added um, regular Ethernet and TCP IP gets 96% of what you can get with RDMA and InfiniBand. There's really no reason to go to an exotic network. And there's definitely no reason to go to an exotic file system like a Lustre or a GPFS when you can use this. So, so those are essentially a summary of the differences when we say this is a fundamentally different and advancement in NAS world. Those are the things that were not available in scale out NAS that are defining what hyperscale NAS is. Um, a few details, just announcement summary things. Um, we are a standard license for our global data environment and the capabilities that you're invoking of hyperscale NAS, the different data services, um, data orchestration are all included in that standard license. Um, from a customer experience perspective, they can use existing storage, third-party storage, existing cloud, whatever they choose. Um, so it's completely storage agnostic and can use what they have today or will help them specify what is the most optimal um, for their workload if it's a new environment. Um, it's available now, generally available and deployed. There's nothing um, that is not in customer hands in production code today. and. Um, if you want any references, Ben actually is a good one because Ben knows a lot about what we're doing on um, this in the room. But we also have two other analyst white papers on hyperscale NAS that we'll be sending out to you all. Um, one from Ray Lucchese and one from Mark Stamer. So we have um, you know, begun to create the analyst white papers around this. And then within the press release, you'll find um, Gary Greider from Los Alamos, who is really leaning into um, how this will be deployed as the intersection of AI and HPC is occurring in the world. Um, huge, huge luminary in the HPC world, and he's helping in um, guiding the future roadmap for Hammerspace as well. Um, Eric Herzog, who I think all of you probably know, um, is quoting our press release and really leaning in on the partnership as the way to expand InfiniDAT's footprint outside of the block storage world. And then I won't go into too much detail on Tom. He's actually coming later today in Tech Live and talking about their technologies. But the advancements in that stack of taking hops out of the data path that David was walking through, where we've gotten it down to four, there are some concepts of you could even go further by embedding the, um, the, ser the, N the NFS server into an Ethernet SSD that would even further optimize that data path. Um, so that's kind of a future thing, but that's actually a partnership that somebody else will be here talking later about today. So as we I don't say- know if he's announcing that part yet. Oh, I, I don't know that he's announcing know. that, no. but his technology and Ethernet attached yeah. SSD is what's needed to accomplish that. So, you know, when Chris says, oh, well, Brian is a fundamentals guy and the technology already exists and what is next and all those things, we're continuing to chase performance efficiencies and how to deploy this in the next generation of capabilities. And we don't have competition right now in this space, but I also said industry is leaning in heavily and we have a lot of industry partners who are collaborating, bringing it to market, developing new things, which we'll be leaning into. So um, I just want to call attention to kind of some of the groundswell support that is occurring. And you'll see it in the press release when Fred and team sends it out, or Lisa, Lisa's the boss today. Could you say a little bit more about the Nimbus Data Partnership, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you want to talk about it, actually? Um, 
Uh, well, actually, I'm not sure how much of it he's going to announce. I don't know either. And, and it's about his timetable. <laughs> he's going to be speaking later. You can grill him on the partnership with Hammerspace. But it's some future stuff that I don't think he's, he's announcing yet. Slippery. I'm sorry. <laughs> we had well, we breakfast with CEO him this morning. Could, well, it's a different CEO you have to refer yeah, to. Yeah, we had breakfast with him this morning down upstairs. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I just want to like, tie up. We'll put this up because Fred has given us the hook. Um, you know, just kind of a visual of Hammerspace at large. We've talked a lot about data orchestration and the global data environment in the past. And now we're talking about hyperscale NAS. And so when you think about what customers' problems are, there's the performance, feeding their compute environment, e infrastructure efficiency, and then there's having data accessible where you want it. But being able to do that all in one unified global data environment is kind of the utopia of what they would like to have. And that's what we're delivering. And we're done. <laughs> Yay. <laughs>